Right. Good to see you again. Yes, good to see you, my friend. Namaste, namaste to you and to all the all the people who are already here. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to our webinar um, webinar which we call now "Birding Made Easy" by Mike Prince. And these webinars are regular features every every Thursday. Uh, but I think we do take a break once in a while. Uh, you know, so so averaging about three three and a half webinars a month. So not too bad. Mm -hmm. Welcome, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our um, world of yeah. virtual birding. Brian says yeah. it's cold, cold there. I thought you were supposed to have just had the warmest March on record or something like that. <laughs> okay, so Brian is saying, Brian Short is saying it's um, from Broad Stairs, England. I don't know what that is. Uh, you would yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Brian's uh, stretched in Worcester where it's cold. So. Yeah. Okay, okay. And Richard is here, Sanjeev is here, Sumit, welcome Sumit, welcome Ramesh. Hello again, welcome. you guys. Yeah, yeah. So we have one Angami with us, Lumpila Santam. She is my pal and she's the one who handles Gear Birding Lodge all by herself. Mm -hmm. with her so she is from Nagaland mm -hmm. and, um, you know. There's Sanjeev in Nepal. Yeah, there's Sanjeev in Nepal and there's Annie. Uh, welcome, welcome Annie, Sean, Deepak. All of you, uh, welcome to uh, to this webinar. It's going to be so interesting because we're going to be talking about various uh, dimensions of Nagaland that you may not uh, have known about. And um, Mike is going to take you through it. So Mike, I'm going to uh, introduce you first, uh, especially to those few people who uh, may not know you enough. So friends, Mike lived in Delhi in the year 2002. He was a very active member of Delhi Bird Club and a contributor to the Atlas of Birds of Delhi in Haryana. After he moved to Bangalore, he got interested in exploring sites that weren't visited so frequently. He worked for Bird Count India to help promote Indian birding and especially high quality data recording. He's an eBird reviewer for India. His interest in bird recording and migration led to a short-term assignment of running the BTO's bird track program. Each week, he would check the BBC weather pages to find out what the weather had been like in Britain, so he could write an article discussing re recent bird occurrences. So welcome, Mike, once again. And, uh, <laughs> thanks. And I'm going to introduce myself as well. Um, I'm Mohit Agarwal. I'm blessed with four children, a son and a daughter, and two non-humans. One Labrador and one uh, escapee African Grey. I'm the follower of Shiva. Professionally, I'm an experiential ecotourism specialist with deep, with a deep love for nature. I help people travel to some wonderful places in Asia. I'm the founder of Asian Adventures. Now it's going to complete 27 years. It's the largest uh, bird watching tour company in India. The company is on a large mission to help Asian elephants with their corridors, free the Himalayas of plastic waste, and help small small wildlife NGOs, and also save the ancient Himalayan shrines. My interest is to promote ecotourism, and my wish is to avoid every group of Ah, so there is echo here. Anyway, um, I will quickly finish my introduction. Just to let you know, uh, Mike, uh, in 2010, when uh, uh, Sumit Bikram and uh, Banu and I we visited Doyan Dam uh, in Nagaland and you know uh, there was this um, army canteen and there was uh, a little shack that was selling samosas. We, we sat there to have samosa and chai and the gentleman started to talk about birds and he says the huge congregation of birds that happened in October, November and people shoot them down. So, 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 you know, we were, we were, uh, you know, we wondered what, what it was all about. Then later we found out that um, the lady from Singapore, Joyce Tan, had uh, visited that area one year earlier, and she'd mentioned that, but she was not a bird watcher. She was on, uh, uh, she was collecting textile samples, and and she was more interested in in uh, textiles there. But she reported this this congregation, and uh, that's when the entire research and everything started. So, 
and then 2012 is when Bano started to work with the local people there for conservation of Amur falcons. So this is all about Amur falcons. Uh, that was my first visit to Nagaland as well. Um, so a uh, little story from me. Now over to Mike. Mike, you go ahead, and I'm going to go silent. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Yep, um, we could do this entire webinar really just by talking about one species in Nagaland, uh, the one you just mentioned there. Um, but um, uh, there's a lot of other good birds in Nagaland, not uh, quite unexplored, a lot of it, a lot of good things to find and some fantastic culture and history about the place. So I'm going to keep everyone waiting for the uh, falcons and start um, with some of the other great birding uh, that Nagaland has to offer. Okay, so. Nagaland, that's one of the great birds that Nagaland has to offer. We'll come on to that one again. Uh, so Nagaland is in the northeast of India, far northeast, one of India's smallest states. Um, it's quite different to most of the rest of India, I suppose. Um, it actually gets referred to as a republic of villages quite often. Um, there's lots, lots of villages all with their own elected councils and they have considerable autonomy on how everything is run in their village. Um, in terms of the land, uh, natural habitats, most of it, I think 90% or more, is community owned. So there aren't large protected areas um, run by the forest department, for example. It really is looked after by villages and communities. Where are we? We're right up here in the northeast of India. Um, so our red dot there, which is um, south of the Brahmaputra River, where we've been on previous webinars. Um, and just um, on the border with Myanmar. So it's very tribal, lots of tribes settled in Nagaland at different times, um, but uh, it also has quite a big European history or British history um, from the 1830s when um, Captains Jenkins and Pemberton from the British Army um, tried to find a way through Manipur to Assam and so they were the first people or first Westerners really um, to make documented contact with uh, Nagaland, uh, and you'll see lots of colonial influence um, from uh, from the sort of late 19th century um, up to the mid 20th century. But um, traditionally, the people in Nagaland, have, there's 16 major tribes, and we'll talk about a few of those. Um, and there's quite a lot of um, sort of sub tribes, if you like, in there, and lots of well known um, festivals, well known and not so well known. Uh, so we'll go through a few of those main ones. A lot of the tribes now have converted to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the areas, one of the most well-known tribes in this area. This place we'll talk about a little bit more later, Konoma, but the Angami tribe. Um, and they're a little bit unusual. The landscape is a little bit unusual here. Because this is all terrace agriculture, um, whereas much of Nagaland is much more traditionally slash and burn. So jume, as it's called here, or shifting cultivation. Um, but here it's a um, more stable terrace agriculture. Uh, they were a, a hunting tribe, um, no longer practiced generally. So these are some of the um, Angamis. Um, so the clothing you'll notice similar similarities with all the tribes, but um, also quite a lot of um, uh, small differences they have. So the women um, who, like a lot of India, um, do most of the work, whilst men don't do quite so much, so the women are working in the fields, but they're also weaving. So it's the clothes are woven by the women. And this is a morong, which is a sort of house or hut um, from bamboo and cane. It's um, uh, a sort of symbol of the village, a little symbol of pride where people, young men particularly would hear uh, stories of their history, where they make decisions about um, wars and um, various village matters. And they also keep um, trophies in here. So that'll be hunting trophies, um, weaponry and things, which we'll um, unfortunately see more of. And some of the food in Nagaland, this is gallo, um, made from smoked pork or beef. So there's a lot of pork eaten, a lot of beef. Um, so this dish is a little bit like kitchri, which um, our Indians will know it. It's, dal and rice cooked together with water. This doesn't have dal here, but instead has vegetables and meat. The major festival in the, for the Angamis is the Sakrenyi festival, um, which goes on for about 10 days. 
um, and it's in late February um, in our calendar. So it's meant to clean, cleanse the body and rid the body of all sins and purify the village. Uh, and there's specific rituals that are carried out every day during this festival, um, specific songs, dances and food. This is all part of the Sakrini festival. Uh, and um, uh, I nearly failed this time, but uh, this is my only alcohol slide in the entire presentation, unusually this week. But this is um, a drinking rice beer, uh, which we've talked about before. I think when we went to our nutshell, so especially prepared for the festival. This uh, fantastic, colourful village here. This is uh, Mokokchong, which is a home to the Ao tribe, the Ao tribe. So they call themselves Awa, which means um, those who came, and these are supposedly came from the west. So um, from uh, the Diku River, which um, joins with the Brahmaputra. This is inside their, um, their little hut, their morong. And some of the food, they have smoked pork uh, with anishi or noishi, which is um, made by fermenting yam leaves or colocasia leaves. And they, they're fermented and they make it into sort of patties, which can then be powdered. And that's boiled up with some spices and tomatoes and pork um, in this case, usually served with rice. And of course, when you talk about Naga food, uh, most people will know of this one, the Bucht Jolokia, one of the most famous chilies in the world. Um, grown not just in Nagaland, uh, but in Assam quite often as well. So this is one of the hottest chilies that exists. And one of the festivals for the owls is the Muatsu Festival. This is in the first week of May. Um, and it's meant to be uh, accepting blessings from God after you've done things like building a house or you've had a marriage in your family. And going a little bit further north, we'll have a look at the um, geography of um, Nagaland a little bit, but this is in Waka district, the home of the Lota tribe, uh, who are thought to come from sort of eastern China. They were also a, a tribe of headhunters, which we'll talk about in a little bit more. And again, there's their uh, morung and their, their traditional dress. So, and cooking um, pork with bamboo shoots, which again is um, obviously orientally influenced, but a lot of pork eaten here. Uh, and there it is. Um, and in fact, um, looking at this pork uh, reminds me that when I visited Nagaland in 2016, um, I went in the autumn and I joined up with a few people from Mumbai. Um, and we went to Nagaland for a, a week or 10 days or something like that. Um, and for me, Part of the traveling in India is, is enjoying the local food, whatever it is. Um, and pork is not something you get very much in India at all. Um, it's, pigs aren't thought to be particularly clean. It's not eaten most, most of the country. Um, but in Nagaland, it's, it's the prime meat. So um, I was really looking forward to trying some, some really nice pork. And uh, I think there were about eight of us in the group. And we stayed in some small homestays with families. And um, I was a bit confused because every meal came out as um, some quite nice food, but it was all vegetarian. And it's then I discovered that all my friends from Mumbai were vegetarian. So I was the only meat eater in the whole group, which I was a bit disappointed about. Um, but anyway, after like three or four days of this and then getting a bit tired thinking that this pork must be really good, I asked the family we were staying with, can you make some pork just for, just for me? So they did, they made a dish of um, a pork curry, which came to the table and it looked really good. And I tasted it, it was great. And then as soon as I said, oh, this is really nice. Suddenly all my Mumbai friends announced that they weren't actually vegetarian. They just said they were, and they saw my pork and thought, oh, this looks really good. And they all tucked into it and I had hardly any of it. So anyway, that's it. So um, that just shows you actually that um, uh, Indians traveling in India are a bit like some of the uh, British who come and born and won't eat the local food, won't eat the meat, go try and go safe. Indians are just the same with it as well. So anyway, next time I'm making sure I eat more pork. Uh, so this is um, uh, the Lota tribe, one of their main festival. Toku Imong festival, which is a, an end of harvest festival in November. Uh, 
Uh, Zuniboto district in central Nagaland is home of the Sumi tribes, who were, um, were a famous warrior tribe. They were also headhunters. Again, in their similar traditional dress. And this is some food. This is actually not just this tribe, there's various tribes that make this. This is called Aksoni, I think it's called, or Akuni, which is uh, fermented soya beans. And the main festival they have is the Tuluni festival in July, which is another harvest festival. It's time supposed to be the end of the dry season and the start of um, uh, the fruiting season. So again, like they must do, most of these festivals, they have uh, feasts, uh, rice beer, uh, and they make offerings. So they slaughter um, animals, uh, pigs, cows, and mittens, which we'll see a little bit later. Not the slaughtering of them, thankfully. And the most famous festival uh, many of you have heard of, and I expect quite a few people in India have been, is the Hornbill Festival. Um, the Hornbill is an um, important bird in many tribes' folklores. Unfortunately, traditionally, that meant that they were hunted and the casks were worn on their head. Like that. Um, but the Hornbill Festival is a, a festival from multiple tribes. It's now organized by the government and lots of tribes come together for 10 days in December. Um, and there's lots of art, um, music performances, dance, craft, food, um, a very popular attraction. So these are all various tribes coming to the Hornbill Festival. You can try your hand at um, climbing the bamboo pole, if you like. Okay, and then some of the fun side of Naga history. Um, Headhunting. So headhunting was carried out by many Naga tribes in the past. So if they had a, a conflict between tribes, the victor in a fight would take the head of the defeated to keep as a trophy. And what would happen would be men would get tattooed for each head they had. So it looks like this chap was quite successful um, looking at his chest. Um, but also there some of the traditions were that um, uh, a boy or a man was not able to marry until he had at least one tattoo, one head for himself. And this tradition continued until I think it was in the mid 1900s when it was actually banned. Um, although a lot of tribes since have converted to Christianity um, and missionaries visited preaching non-violence, etc., um, had stopped, but um, but it's not that long ago, really. But unfortunately, hunting generally is um, a huge pastime, has been a huge pastime, still is a major problem in Nagaland. So hunting for food, but also culture uh, and for leisure, um, it's extremely common and they'd keep animal trophies. So here, maybe buffaloes um, possibly kept up here. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of hunting going on now. So when you're traveling in Nagaland, you will see signs of animals or birds being hunted and sold for food at the side of the road. So this um, interesting creature is a spotted linsang, a small mammal, a bit like a civet. Um, and so pretty much everything's hunted. Apparently nearly 100 species of mammals have been recorded hunted, hunted in Northeast India generally. Uh, several threatened species. And people, I think, would know that hunting is illegal. It's the Wildlife Protection Act in India from 1972 um, made all hunting is illegal. But I think the the way the villages are governed and the local communities having a lot of autonomy sort of gives the locals or suggests the locals that they're actually allowed from their traditional practices. They, 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 they own the forest, they own the trees, they own the wildlife that's inside it. And it was probably when the population was much lower, this was reasonably sustainable, but it's become more of a commercial operation. They hunt with guns rather than the traditionally traps. Uh, they fish with electric charges put through the water to kill everything in it rather than nets and traps um, in the past. And there's certainly places you can go through in Nagaland where you find the forests are empty. Uh, there's just too much hunting being on. So uh, this one's a particularly tragic one for anyone who can identify this. This is a beautiful nuthatch, which really is a stunning bird and a top target to see if you visit the northeast. And all sorts of things are hunted. So these are bats and frogs. 
So it is quite a problem. It is less of a problem than it was. And uh, we'll talk about uh, some of that um, coming up when we talk about some of the conservation uh, measures that are, that are happening now. Right. Anyway, uh, but for our trip around Nagaland, um, traveling around Nagaland is uh, reasonably easy logistically. Um, Investor visits are between October and May. And you come into Dimapur is the usual place to come. But traveling does have some issues in Nagaland. As I'll come on to. This is the sort of route we're doing today. Dimapur is down in the bottom left a little bit, um, but um, Konoma towards the bottom left is one of the main sites. Over to the east side is Pungro, right on the Myanmar border. And then we'll go up to the north a bit more, uh, Zonabotu, which I talked about, and Doyang, which is our Amafalkan area. But traveling in Nagaland, as I mentioned, is quite difficult because of things like this. I think I'd say the Nagaland roads are the worst I've ever experienced anywhere. So especially if you're traveling in the autumn after the rains, uh, this is quite the common sight, unfortunately. So don't believe Google's timings when you look at how long it takes to get from one place to another. But if you do get places, uh, this is Kohima. So this is the capital of Nagaland uh, in the south. So a very strong wartime history, uh, which some of you may uh, be aware of. The Japanese in World War II tried to take um, India through Kohima, uh, coming through Burma. Um, and uh, in 1944, there was the Battle of Kohima, which is a, a very well-known battle, which effectively changed the course of the war in Asia. Um, and, and you'll see lots of signs of it when you're around in Kohima. Uh, so these are some of the actual photos from the Second World War, the battle between the Japanese and the British there. Interesting cars they used in war having the same problem with the roads that we have today. So that's not changed. But this is Kohima Ridge, where the Battle of Kohima took place. Um, and it was huge. There were more than 10,000 people uh, on both sides who died in this battle. But, um, but as I said, it did change the course of the war. So one of the sites in Kohima a lot of people go to visit is the Kohima War Cemetery, uh, dedicated a memorial to all those who died in that battle. Um, and um, uh, you might um, see this is quite a, a famous epitaph um, that is um, quoted quite often um, in other places now. This is the original um, epitaph written by a British poet, I think, um, which is in Kohima War Cemetery. But if you are traveling around, uh, some of the wildlife you might see, uh, well, not really wildlife, this is a mitten. So this is a cross between a gore and domestic cattle. Um, and it's, it's a sign of um, status amongst people if you own many mittens. In the wild, well, you'd be very lucky to see one, but um, there's a reasonable population of Asiatic black bear. And Hulok Gibbon, this is India's only ape, or, or was until it was split. This is the Western Hulok Gibbon, and Eastern Hulok Gibbon also occurs just about in India. One new animal you will see, you won't see a lot around, unfortunately, but this one you will see is the cute small Himalayan striped squirrel. Okay, the internet connection is struggling a little bit, so I hope I'm going to be able to keep up, probably. But this is a, a really interesting animal, the ferret badger. It's a, um, a mustelid, so like weasels and badgers and, um, and ferrets. Very much a cross between a ferret and a badger. Look at that. This is Chinese ferret badger. Uh, super place for butterflies, uh, Nagaland. I don't know um, how well studied it is. There's certainly a few hundred species of butterflies. Uh, the Naga sapphire, which is actually a type of blue, although it doesn't look so in from that picture. Uh, 
and uh, not a sunbeam, a subspecies of a different type of sunbeam, acute sunbeam. And that's stunning uh, subspecies again, but uh, azure sapphire, so the Naga azure sapphire. So moving um, down to our sort of first main site, community conservation area in Nagaland. Um, in, back in the 1990s, um, apparently known to have killed 300 blithe tragopans in one week. Um, just phenomenal to think of that. Um, but anyway, this village were pretty progressive and they themselves decided to stop hunting and set up the sanctuaries, the Kanoma Nature Conservation and Tragopan Sanctuary. Um, it's a small um, 20 square kilometer sanctuary um, just outside the village. And it's relatively close to Kohima, so it gets quite a few visitors. Um, and gradually, um, this has become one of the best places in Nagaland to see uh, a lot of difficult birds to find elsewhere. Plenty of homestays in this area, so it's geared up for environmental tourism generally. A similar view, you can see the forests on the side of the terraced um, fields. So it's the Konoma Green Village. But this is the sort of forest. So, so Nagaland is, is very much forest. There is some fantastic forest, um, uh, and which back in its peak before there was too much hunting must have been absolutely full of wildlife. So uh, thankfully there are some brilliant patches and wildlife is recovering in many places and it's well worth um, exploring. The Tsuku Valley is a popular trekking area in this area near Kohima. And not far from Konoma, the pretty village of uh, Zuluki, which also um, has some super birds around. So what super birds do they have? Well, actually, this one is uh, the tree sparrow. Uh, and in this part of India, tree sparrow is the common sparrow. So this is the one that's in all the towns and villages in the places that house sparrows are in much of the rest of the country and, and the rest of west, further west in Europe. But there are house sparrows around as well. But there are some more impressive birds. So this is Blythe Stragopan, uh, truly stunning, far more often heard than seen. And of course, not easy here because of the hunting in the past, um, but um, it's clearly actually a relatively common bird. One bird you have a slightly better chance of seeing, which is um, uh, uh, a tough one in many other places. This is mountain bamboo partridge. It um, goes in various other of the Northeastern states or south of the Brahmaputra probably not that uncommon but it's a shy it's a particularly shy bird so um, hunting is a problem but um you can find these around konoma including the the very famous birding spot called the konoma parking lot uh which particularly in the mornings um the birds come out to feed on the road and feed on uh or use grit to help their digestion black tail crake is um uh, difficult to see, as you'd expect from a uh, crake, but it uh, occurs in most of these areas. We had a nice sighting when I was there of one swimming across a pond. Bay woodpecker is quite a stunner, a long bill. It's a, a difficult one to see, actually. It stays low down, but in quite dense forest and dense bamboo, but it's very noisy. Grey headed parakeet, uh, also sometimes known as finch's parakeet or eastern slaty parakeet. It's very similar to slaty-headed parakeet um, and you get into the further west than the Himalayas, a bit yellower, brighter yellower and brighter yellow tail. And one regular really nice bird um, to see in this area is crested finchbill. Uh, it's a type of bulbul, but it's unique in having this, this big um, pale bill. Um, and it's quite a um, quite conspicuous bird. It's noisy and common in places. So you usually come across small flocks of these in various parts. Flavescent bulbul, um, another one that is um, uh, um, one that occurs sort of south of the Brahmaputra, quite widespread, but doesn't go across the, the river to the north or the west. So the Brahmaputra is an interesting barrier. There's so many birds that occur to the north, uh, but don't occur to the south. Uh, or at least a different subspecies on the south. It's been an ecological barrier. Um, so when you're exploring this area, south of the Brahmaputra, um, to close to the Myanmar border, there's a lot of um, variation in some of the birds that occur elsewhere that um, are subspecies, but quite possibly good um, species with more study. 
chestnut vented natach. Uh, this one's a confused taxonomy. It's sometimes considered a subspecies of European natach, uh, but it doesn't particularly look like one. It um, occurs throughout Southeast Asia and only not commonly in India at all, but it is um, named after Nagaland. It's Sita nagaensis. Uh, so presumably the type specimen was from this area. Some of the warblers you'll find, actually throated warbler, which obviously is widespread. And you're the browed warbler, which is quite widespread in the northeast. Probably quite a few interesting philosophers warblers that haven't been sorted out yet. Uh, some of the Chinese warblers, for example, may well occur here. And speaking of warblers, this is mountain tailor bird, which is not actually a tailor bird, um, although it looks a bit like one. Uh, it doesn't cock its tail like tailor birds do, um, but it is a it is really a warbler. It's um, a bush warbler, it's like a Chetty's warbler family. Uh, and fire-tailed sunbird, real stunner when they have their long tails. Like this they breed breed quite high up, but breed in rhododendron typically. Grey Sibia is quite smart. This is a, much like the common Rufus Sibia further west, um, but without the Rufus. Uh, similar size, similar behaviour. Again, doesn't go north of the Brahmaputra River in its distribution. Rusty capped Fulvetta, uh, similar again distribution just in this part of the world. Quite a large Fulvetta, often one of the birds in, in mixed species flocks. And this spectacular bab babbler. Catcher well, wedge-billed babbler, uh, one you can also see in Arunachal, I'll get there. This is also known as chevron-breasted babbler now. The one real major target I'm coming to Nagaland is Naga red babbler or long-tailed red babbler, which is well-named um, on both parts. Well-named because it has a long tail and also well-named because it occurs almost only in Nagaland. It's endemic to India. It just, just goes further south across the border in uh, Manipur, uh, but otherwise is, is almost a, an actual Naga state endemic, but fairly widespread uh, through the state. Assam laughing thrush, the um, uh, member of the chestnut crowned laughing thrush family. One laughing thrush that has lots of variation across its whole range. Brown capped laughing thrush. This is a scarce one, a uh, very restricted range. It goes from Nagaland south a bit. You don't find it north of Nagaland. Um, so Manipur, Mizoram, and just across the Myanmar border. And there's quite a lot of species that have that sort of distribution. Uh, so this area of, of southern northeast India, uh, Nagaland, Manipur, and across the border into Myanmar, uh, where the, the forest is all contiguous with Myanmar. Striped laughing thrush is quite a smart one. This is um, uh, is best seen around Konoma. And white browed laughing thrush, uh, slightly easier to see. This is a, a bolder one. I quite find these in small, quite noisy parties sometimes. Uh, purple kachoa, um, really interesting birds. The, they're sort of thrushes. Uh, they're fruit eating, um, quite quiet birds, not very easy to see. Thought to be summer visitors traditionally, but I noticed when I was checking on the maps and things, there are various records in this area from, from the winter, um, but there isn't much known about where they actually do winter regularly. Chestnut-bellied rock thrush, which you'll know from Western Himalayas as well as East. And a couple of the true thrushes, so eyebrow thrush, which is a winter visitor here. And a very smart black-breasted thrush, which um, is, is resident or probably resident. So moving on a little bit from Kanoma, but now, but still southwest Nagaland, close to the Manipur border. It's an area called Benro, which is um, another um, uh, um, nice village with protected um, forest around, community protected forest. Uh, good for a similar selection of birds, actually, to um, Kanoma. Part of the Benru village and their huts. Golden throated barbet. It's quite a common barbet throughout the northeast. Uh, hear them very often. 
uh, long-tailed broadbill. It's done over also in the Western Himalayas so throughout the East. Maroon Oriole. So these are all birds that have a fairly widespread uh, distribution. As does the Nepal Fulvetta. And the Shrike Babbler here is um, Blythe's uh, Shrike Babbler, uh, what used to be part of the white browed Shrike Babbler complex. And it's Blythe's you get in, in the east. And the really smart ones, this is very small uh, Shrike Babbler, black eared Shrike Babbler. Um, often sometimes moving in small mixed species flocks and, and quite high in the canopy sometimes, so don't all forget stunning views like this, but a uh, brilliant bird. Bar wings, rusty fronted bar wing is the, the commonest of the bar wing species. We get small groups of these. And silver admissias are quite common in small parties as well. This is uh, the leaf bird you find in here, orange bellied leaf bird. Uh, you also have blue winged leaf birds in um, this part of east and northeast. And, uh, so these are nice, reasonably common forest birds, yellow-bellied fantail, yellow-cheeked tit. The commonest of the owls is Asian barred owlet. And raptors wise, um, not, don't tend to see too many raptors here, probably because of the amount of hunting that's been in the past. Black eagles um, occur throughout a lot of it, the area though in Nagaland. And then we head east, head east to Pongro. Uh, so Pongro is right on the Myanmar border, uh, Fakim Wildlife Sanctuary. And this is a, a potentially really interesting um, area of habitat. So you're in forest that's contiguous um, across the border into Myanmar. Um, and it goes up quite a wide um, elevational range as well. So Mount Saramati um, is the highest point here at 3,800 meters. Not often birded in this area, um, but very good for some laughing thrushes that have that sort of same distribution of the of Nagaland a little bit further south and into Myanmar. Um, and I'm sure there's a few uh, Myanmar birds that haven't yet been found in India, but you could find them in this sort of area. So these are the forests at Pongro. So one of the really interesting laughing thrushes, uh, spot-breasted laughing thrush. Um, this one occurs elsewhere, you can get them into Arunachal a little bit as well. Um, and again, it varies in the region. It's very skulking, so unusually open. Uh, very skulking, but has a fantastic song. So a musical song and lots of mimicry of other species. Mustached laughing thrush, uh, also known as ashy laughing thrush. This is a rare one with, a, again, a very restricted range and across into Myanmar as well. And this brilliant one is yellow-throated laughing thrush, it's quite a small laughing thrush, often in small flocks. Um, in fact, on the, um, the same trip I was talking about earlier where um, I failed on the pork, I, I also interestingly failed on this bird. Um, it's not a bird that normally occurs around Doyang with the Amafalcon area. Um, and we spent a day um, just looking at Amafalcons. Um, and We'll come to them later, but it was such a spectacular experience. I couldn't tear myself away. So I spent the entire day dawn till dusk in the main area where I could watch Amma Falcons. And the rest of the group decided in the middle of the day that it was getting a little bit quieter there. Uh, they'd go off and see some more birds. And they came back with the first ever record of yellow-throated laughing thrush from the area, which unsurprisingly weren't there the next day when I tried to find them. So not a bird I've seen. Uh, Scimitar babbler. This is streak-breasted scimitar babbler. Uh, quite secretive, like lots of scimitar babblers are, but probably fairly common in this area. So you have streak-breasted scimitar babbler, and you also have spot-breasted scimitar babbler. Um, this is a bit like rusty-cheeked scimitar babbler that you get in Western Himalayas, without the rusty bit on the cheeks, but similar um, patterning otherwise. 
not too much of a surprise being right on the um, border with Myanmar or Burma that you could find Burmese shrike here. Uh, it is rare in India, not too many records, but uh, if you're going to find it anywhere, this is where it is. And a really impressive parrot bill. Um, some of you may have seen black breasted parrot bill in some of the grasslands in Assam and Arunachal. It's a very similar uh, spot breasted parrot bill, similar, similar habitats as well. Now, moving um, back uh, up, going a bit further north into this is central Nagaland now, Zuniboto district, um, again, a very forested district. Um, this is an area, um, lots of um, community conserved areas. So um, uh, set up by the villagers themselves, a lot of Nagaland is like this, where uh, the villagers conserve part of the forest around the villages. So they they um, call an area, effectively protect an area, ban hunting, ban fishing, ban tree cutting um, in these areas. And this is something that they've they've done themselves over years, but I think probably driven by recognition that um, the forest was degrading, uh, and there was over hunting happening, and especially maybe going back 50 years when there was a lot of logging going on, uh, the sale of meat was probably more commercial than it used to be, and it wasn't really sustainable. So these areas are set aside for community areas. Um, and apparently it's about one third of Naga villages have these um, uh, CCAs, community conserved areas. Now there's lots of work with NGOs working in the area to help maybe develop some ecotourism in some of these places. Um, so it's great that they're doing this. It's not easy because obviously this is, this is land that they're losing their livelihoods from to some extent. The timber is much more valuable than it used to be. And they're protecting some of these areas. So there's still a fair bit of poaching um but um it's an interesting sort of unique concept in india in these um uh, community conserved areas and so this area is fairly newly known for birding i think this whole area around uh, zunaboto and sukai uh, one of the other villages around here uh, but it's a really interesting place uh, a lot of good birds turning up in this area the few people who have been visiting uh, striated swallow, and I find a few places like this, the sort of eastern red rump swallow, much stronger streaks below. And intriguingly, uh, um, a few records of dark rumped swift, uh, which is a really little known species, um, partly because the identification is quite difficult. Here, you can even see in this because a nice light is really scaled below, but um, it's known from Megalaya, which is where most people go to see it, around Cherapunji and places like that thought to only be a summer visitor in this area but no one really knows where they winter um, still in india or whether they go to southeast asia at all but more and more sightings from this area recently green billed malcoa which occurs west to Uttarakhand, is quite scarce in the west it's actually also occurs down the eastern guts i think probably as far as andhra pradesh as well but it's a commoner in the northeast Plaintive cuckoo, like grey-bellied cuckoo, the orange below. Mountain imperial pigeon, which um, in the northeast is a little bit different from the one in the western guts, um, and is quite likely to be split at some point. Mm -hmm. So we'd have another a new western guts endemic if that happens. Collared scops owl, probably the um, fairly mm, the commonest of the more nocturnal owls in this area. Mm. And um, this great bird is Hodgson's frogmouth. Um, there's in a few places in the East Himalayas, it's been found a little bit more in recent years, like at Mishmi Hills and places like that. Um, in this area, in Zunaboto district around Sukai, it actually seems to be quite regular. So probably is in other places in the northeast. Piculet, white brown piculet, a tiny, tiny woodpecker. And some of the small birds, if you catch up with a mixed species uh, feeding flock, um, you find some of these, these birds, so things like rufous capped warbler. And lemon rumped warbler. Um, which if you see lemon rump warblers in this part of India, um, worth trying to um, hear them call or preferably sing because this is uh, in recent, um, well, recent years, but a little bit more this winter, 
people have started to find what we suspect a Sichuan leaf warbler, one of the Chinese leaf warblers, which is almost identical. The call is slightly different, um, but it will be something if you're in this part of India and you see a lemon rumpt, and especially if you hear it, let's try and get some call recordings. So Sichuan leaf warbler hasn't yet been confirmed 100% in India, but is um, almost definitely does occur. Refescent uh, Prinia, this is a difficult one to find. And some of the other bulbuls we've got here, mountain bulbul. And white throated. Common and small birds, this is a whiskered Yehina. Street spider hunter, which is uh, one of the one of the commonest birds in some of the forests in the northeast. Little spider hunter also occurs in places. And uh, spot the bird, always hiding in rhododendron, the stunning coloured Mrs. Gould's sunbird. One of the other forvetters is the, the um, cute, um, fluffy-headed uh, Manipur forvetter or streak-throated fulvetta. Grey-throated babbler is one of the one of the skulkers that often forms parts of the small species, um, mixed species flocks in a lot of the northeast. As does stunning golden babbler. Rufus backed sibia. And they're usually skulking, so you don't quite see the red like that. Red-faced Leocicla. Mm -hmm. Spotted Elotura. We talked about this in, a, in an earlier webinar. Um, thought to be a red babbler, but actually distinct from babblers and is in a family of its own. So um, there is only one Elotura in the world. And one of the other parrot bills that's quite difficult to find now seems to be declining quite a lot. Grey headed parrot bill so is probably one of the better places to find them. So, missed out one species. There's a bird I haven't talked about. So, I'm sure everyone's aware of um, Nagaland and its Amar falcons. Um, and the name being given to it a bit as Falcon Capital of the World which really is um, a very well-deserved title. So this is a part of a small flock of Amar falcons. So what do you know about the Amar falcon story? So it's centered on Doyang Reservoir. So we're in um, we'll see the central west side of Nagaland, as you can see from that map. Um, and the Doyang Reservoir here, it was created in the year 2000 from a hydroelectric project that um, uh, dammed the Doyang River. Uh, so lots of um, farmland was flooded. Um, that caused quite a lot of issues in the community, but people weren't necessarily adequately compensated for the loss of farming. Uh, and a lot more people took to fishing afterwards as their major source of income. So it was the year 2000 um, that the reservoir came. This is Doyang Reservoir as it stands now. And these are the birds we're interested in. So it's interesting that um, um, Amar falcons have presumably been passing through this area in quite large numbers for years after years. But um, it was only really in about 2005, apparently, that locals started to notice huge congregations of Amar falcons near the Doyang Dam. So they presumably hadn't been occurring there um, in such large numbers before the dam was created. And in fact, the local names for Amar falcon, there's a couple of local names. One is uh, Eninum, which is apparently a bird that flies in pairs, um, which would suggest that they weren't flying in large flocks. Um, they were like this, this is a female on the left and a male on the right. Um, and there's another name uh, given to it, which was um, Osunvoro, which means foreign bird. So they clearly recognized these birds are not there for very long, they're, they're passing through. But what was noted was that um, during the day, um, large numbers of Amar falcons typically gather on the on the wires. And then um, in the evening, they come down to the trees and uh, roost overnight in the trees. 
uh, you know, roosting in the trees all around the Doyang Reservoir. So it's interesting that um, uh, speaking to um, the locals, they apparently weren't hunted uh, until about 2005, 2006, um, when a few were obviously hunted just through catapults, like um, uh, slingshots that you see a lot in Nagaland, and people are, are using that for, for fun and leisure and catching a few um, animals and birds for, for the pot mostly. But um, people started to recognize there were lots of birds here and then started uh, using air guns and shooting. And then um, it was discovered that uh, some of the fishermen, obviously in this area, started deciding to use fishing nets to try and catch them. So they were putting uh, fishing nets high up in the trees here. This is a sort of um, incredible scene you're seeing in the uh, late afternoon, birds coming low into roost. But so they started hanging up nets. So these are fishing nets strung quite high and you can see several of the birds um, that are being caught in the nets here. So it was interesting that um, I'm saying it's 2005, 2006, they said they were hunting. As Moy mentioned, it was 2009, uh, I think it was, where this um, lady from Singapore had apparently commented about birds being hunted in huge numbers here. Um, but it was actually, mammoth fogs are only passing through here for just a few weeks in the year. It's, it's October, late October through November. So it's really only about six weeks in a year where the birds are passing through. And so uh, the locals, local fishermen in particular, and people who've, who've lost a lot of income from the flooding of the dam, lost their farmlands, took advantage of uh, what they saw as a, a great source of income for a short period. So stories were going around about this hunting and about the scale of the migration, which wasn't really studied that well. So people, Indian um, ornithologists have known that Amal has come through in large numbers, but not really the quite scale that they were there. Um, so it was in October 2012 when um, a team, uh, Banu, who um, Mohit mentioned, Banu Haralu, who's a, a local, a Naga journalist, she went with a, a team of people, that's Ramki, Ramki Srinivasan, who founded Conservation India, uh, Shashank Dalvi, the well known birdwatcher and researcher and um, another local Naga working with Banu is uh, Roko Hebi Kwatsu and the four of them um, went um, in October to see what was actually going around and find out what was really going on and the scale of this hunting is absolutely incredible in fact it's unbelievable really so they found Amas they found tens twenties of hunters all going around every day catching Amos like this, you see the numbers that they were stringing up, um, it really is quite frightening. So you can just imagine what um, uh, Banu and her team felt when they were first coming across this. Even local kids um, involved in the, in the trade. So I say trade, it was mostly, it's all quite local. Um, birds were being caught and sold in the villages. So Pangti village, which is the main one around very close to the reservoir, was the, the main one where they were being hunted. Um, and they were being sold locally and into some of the villages around. Um, and they would sell them, um, they'd sell something like four to six birds for 100 rupees. So that's one pound for those in the UK. Um, for one pound, you could buy four or five, six Amar Falcons. And they would cook and eat them there or sell them commercially to some of the nearby villages. Really is quite shocking. So the numbers here um, that they tried to estimate from the numbers of hunters, the number of us they were seeing interviews with the locals, re they reckon during the peak time of Amma Falcon congregations here, probably up to about 15,000 birds were being killed every single day. In the, the autumn season, and the main migration season is probably about six weeks, uh, there were probably 120, maybe 140,000 Amma falcons being killed. Um, and it's just, I, I know, we all know birds of prey. I mean, none of us have seen birds of prey in those sort of numbers. You see any birds of prey, it's, it makes your day. You see a, a few tens sometimes or some summer migration, it's incredible. But if you think here, there's 140,000, and those are just the ones that are being killed. How many are actually migrating through here? 
Anyway, uh, once I think they recovered their senses, um, they took lots of photos and videos and um, Conservation India, the uh, NGO, put together this short video about the Amal Falcon massacre. Um, and this went out and this attracted enormous attention, um, international attention. Um, clearly everyone was shocked and no one knew the even the extent of the migration to the level it was, but this is like hunting on an unprecedented scale. Um, and um, what was pretty remarkable was that um, uh, there was instant action taken to stop this hunt. And there was an agreement uh, put in between the um, national government and the local village councils and local NGOs um, to stop the hunting, um, which of course wasn't easy because a lot of people had lost their livelihoods and this, this brings them good money. So um, it's all very well to say, you've got to stop. These people are traditional hunters. It's always been part of their tradition. The only difference here, I suppose, was that the Amur hunting was new. They took advantage of an opportunity, uh, really. But um, it was dramatic. So by the next year, there was no hunting at all in this area. Um, the Many of the hunters there, the fishermen and uh, falcon hunters, um, were now becoming conservationists. Um, They're guarding falcons, guarding the roosting site during passage periods and getting paid um, some amount of money for this. So there's a local NGO, the Nagaland Wildlife and Biodiversity Conservation Trust um, in Pankti village, set up a big um, outreach program and education program for children um, in various villages around here called Friends of the Amma Falcon. And it's, in, it's drastic, uh, what, the work they've done and the education they've done. So they set up a few watchtowers. Um, so this is sort of place we went to in 2016 uh, just stand up here for hours watching falcons and dawn roosting in these trees and then flying in and out and then the most spectacular gathering of falcons at dusk you can you can really imagine. So the friends of the Amal Falcon did lots of um, lots of education. Uh, so there's posters put up everywhere. Uh, a lot of work in schools talking about the Amas and the story of the Amas because it has the most fantastic migration. So the the story when you explain to people who just didn't really know much about this, and I'll talk a little bit more about the migration itself uh, coming on. But one of the things they did, this is Banu herself um, talking to some of the kids there. So we're talking to the kids and the hunters as well. Um, and one of the things that was, this is actually, they're singing the, the song that they wrote, the, the Amafon Kun song. Um, and there's a falcon passport uh, issued to the kids in school around here. Now, the interesting thing on this falcon passport issued by the Ministry of Falcons, you'll notice says the governments of Asia and Africa. So this is what part of the story they were trying to show was that um, uh, it's incredible, the story of these birds wintering in South Africa, as we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. But also one point to make, I think, was that um, these birds perform a useful purpose. So they're insectivores. So the reason they are in um, Nagaland this time of year was mostly to feed on termites as winged termites were emerging. Uh, and there are millions and millions of termites. And that's what these birds are staging for and fattening up before their migration onto Africa. So part of the education really was to explain this is a farming community, um, what job these birds were doing. And also in explaining that by hunting these birds here, farmers in Africa are suffering. Uh, they haven't got the falcons there. They haven't got the pest control there. So their crops are failing because of this. Um, so finding that something in common, I think, was a big part of um, of their their education here. So this is some little notebooks the kids were getting to record their observations of falcons. Um, and there was a lot more done um, here on other wildlife as well. So drawing butterflies in this case and, and generally getting incredible interest in the, their local environment. It's absolutely clear you have to get through to the children um, for this sort of thing. So then they're out, um, they're out moth trapping uh, in the evenings. So the chief minister of Nagaland um, paid a visit in the in the following year. This was 2013, the first year of, of no hunting. And here are some of the the friends of the Amma Falcon. Um, so. Obviously, um, uh, these, um, this work was helping, 
but they the big problem here is really that people have lost their livelihoods and there has to be money coming into them to to really make this worthwhile so it was estimated i think that um hunting in uh, birds in the area was bringing in the villages three three and a half million rupees a year about thirty five thousand pounds which um clearly goes a long way in some of these, these small villages so um there's been attempts to to increase ecotourism a little bit there's quite a few homestays set up in the area but it's difficult to you can't you don't want to do it on a mass scale it's got to be very small it's not an area that can cope uh, with hotels and resorts springing up so all the work has been focused really on just developing community tourism and homestays and ecotourism um it's not necessarily been organized that well enough it's not benefiting the entire community uh, but something's happening um and uh, everyone should go and visit at some stage and, and do their do their bit so also um when this migration to understand this migration a little bit more um in the uh, first year after this um there were some birds that were caught and tagged so these um in fact the bird on the right was one of the first birds that was tagged in 2013 in the autumn this is Naga, the bird was named Naga. There were three birds in that first autumn fitted with satellite tags um, and released um, to try and track them. Um, and um, it's really quite fascinating to find out the routes that these birds are doing. So this is the first three birds that were tagged in that first year. So you see the green at the top um, in China and just into Siberia is, is the breeding ground um, for Amos. Um, and they're going right down into southern Africa, so sort of southeast, south Af eastern southern, South Africa, typically. Um, it's the longest migration of any raptor, I believe. As I mentioned, this the stage they're, they're eating termites um, majorly, so that's why they stop over. So typically you're about six weeks. I don't know how long individual birds stop and stage for, but then after they fattened up, um, on termites, well, they probably double their body weight in termites, and they leave Nagaland. They're then flying across central India and right across the Arabian Sea. So it's an incredible um, uh, overwater journey, which has to be done non stop. So Naga it, it, himself, the uh, first bird tagged, was tracked to do that journey of from Nagaland across the rest of India to Somalia, where they landed in Africa. 5,600 kilometers in just over five days of non-stop flying. Uh, it really is just a phenomenal migration route. Um, and that's that's less than half of their, their one single trip journey, of course. They're then typically staging in East Africa. So the satellites, uh, the tra tracking um, would say that they actually stopped for a while in Somalia. Um, there's East Savo National Park, so, uh, Savo East rather, is a well-known place where they'd stage there and then go further down into Southern Africa. So January to March, they're really in Southern Africa. So interesting, of course, that's their summer. So these birds are getting the longest days. They're, they're migrating to get the longest possible day length in Southern Africa. They're leaving there and coming back up through April, May into India, getting back onto their breeding grounds for sort of June, July, or September, which is the longest day length um, in the North. So they've got the longest time available to feed on various insects. This is another a more recent bird that was tracked. This bird was called Long Leng after another roost site um, in Nagaland in um, a, a slightly different area. Uh, and what's interesting about this particular bird is that it's been tracked doing this round trip at least four times uh, from the breeding grounds uh, into India. Interestingly, um, um, going straight across the Arabian Sea, I think the, the white lines are their autumn route and then the yellows are coming back in the spring. So slightly different route in the spring. And for those of you who are in Mumbai, early May, you can see Amal Falcon um, coming in. They're coming in over Gujarat and, and Mumbai. Uh, I was lucky enough to see Amal Falcon a few years ago before we knew anything about this in Mumbai in I think first week of May. Interesting that this bird then has gone down into southern India before going along the east coast and back up um, into Southeast Asia and up through China back to the breeding grounds. So this is a round trip that's more than 20,000 kilometers. So in this particular bird, as I say, has done it four times. It's done more than 80,000 kilometers in the last um, four years. So it really is a, an incredible migration. 
So it's an incredible migration, but the staging in Nagaland is just, is it almost even more incredible? The numbers are, well, they're uncountable. They're like swarm, swarms of bees or something when you watch them. I, I tried to count when I was there um, and I kept on trying to count getting to like sort of 50,000, 80,000, maybe 100,000, but struggling. Uh, this is just before they're roosting and they're all flying around um, in, when it's getting quite dark and they're all over the place and the noise is incredible. But I think the best estimate from a team that went a few years ago was actually that um, even on a one day community roost, there was a million falcons. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen more than 100,000 of any single bird, but to think that they're, they're falcons like that is, is really incredible. But there's also other sites in the northeast that are apparently having staging in large numbers as well. So they've started tracking the birds from Manipur. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the birds tracked in Manipur um, uh, recently. Well, it was, it was um, caught, uh, satellite tag fitted. And then two days later, not very far away in Manipur, it was shot by a hunter. Um, but actually with hindsight, that probably worked quite well because it attracted quite a lot of local media attention and has helped reduce hunting in that area. So there's various places probably where, where Amos are in these large numbers, um, whether that's birds dispersing from Doyang and maybe there aren't as many there as possible or whether there have always been large numbers elsewhere, isn't really quite known. Maybe the disturbance at Doyang has been too much and they've, they've started moving around a bit, but, um, but it really is one of the um, I know bird spectacles of the world. It could be up there in the top 10 bird spectacles of the world, I have no doubt. I think it's probably the day I spent just looking at Amor Falcons was one of the most memorable birding days in my life. And it's the sort of thing where um, if you're a birder, you have to go at some stage in your lifetime because um, you'd regret not going. It is that spectacular. Um, just thought I'd mention that if this has not been enough for you, um, because there's a lot more to it, um, there's a few um, videos which are super that explain the story of the Amor Falcon. And the original one that went viral that, that um, raised awareness of the, of the problem in the first place. The Race to Save the Amor Falcon was a, a film put together um, for about 20 minutes um, explaining the whole story that I've just summarized briefly, but uh, you should definitely watch that. Because one thing I haven't shown here, of course, is video of, of flocks um, of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of birds calling away, which is spectacular. The BBC, narrated by David Attenborough, did a short, um, uh, just a three minute film on um, Amor Falcons, the one on the bottom left there, which was um, about their feeding. So watching them feeding on termites um, in Nagaland, um, a super watch. And um, if you're interested in Nagaland in more general, um, there's this fantastic webinar done um, a few months ago by Pia Seti, who's an ecologist who's done a lot of working with the Naga communities um, uh, and a lot of um, a lot of fantastic stories about the tribes and the culture and the conservation side and the ecotourism side. Um, so um, I'd urge you to try and watch some of those if you can. Uh, we can put the links in, in the chat as well. But it's an incredible story. Now, I, I need to thank especially Conservation India, uh, Ramki at Conservation India, uh, who gave me loads of information. Um, so loads of the photos and stories and you can find lots of information on their website. Um, and it's been superb and it's Conservation India and the original team were instrumental in getting this work done. But then the local NGOs have, have been super. So there's been various other organisations involved as well who are doing some fantastic work and um, will continue to do so, I'm sure. Um, and also I actually need to thank, um, for a change this, this week, I have to thank my, uh, my daughter Tia, who um, has just finished school and decided she was going to look into Naga tribes. And so she helped me with most of the research on uh, Naga tribes today. So thank you, Tia. And thank you, everybody else. This was absolutely inspirational. Mike, absolutely wonderful. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I can put the Amor Falcons into words, though. It's, um, I'm not normally a very emotional person, but it was it really, I think it must have been the best burning day of my life. It's just an experience you would never, ever forget. And I, I wish I could go there every year. It was absolutely wonderful. So friends, if you've got any questions to ask, please go ahead and put it in uh, the chat box and Mike will happily reply. Just a few more things. Um, Mike is going to uh, lead a tour to Great Himalayan National Park end of uh, April and beginning of May. So there'll be two tours back to back. If anybody is interested in joining, uh, I'm going to put the link here and you could 
use this link to the first link to um, to send me your uh, your details so that you know I can send you um, you know the program and everything. So so that's about uh, Great Himalayan National Park. That's and actually that's actually a trip. Boys. I, I think I first said I'm going to do this trip about 15 years ago, and I never did it. But um, Great Himalayan National Park, if you go in April May time, is about the only place where you have a reasonable chance of seeing Western Tragopan. So we saw a blaze Tragopan in this presentation. I think Western is even nicer to look at. Um, but they're calling this time of year and with a bit of luck and a little bit of effort, um, you can manage to see Western Tragopan. So that will be a, a key aim for for this these short trips, two short trips at the end of April, early May for about a week in some pristine birding areas at a brilliant time of year in the Great Himalayan National Park and rounded off maybe with a tragopan just to make it perfect. Excellent. So Lumpila is, uh, Lumpila is asking you which is the best time to visit Nagaland for birding. Let me tell you, she's a, she's a Naga herself and she's, she's ah. working in the nation, but she wants it, to know something from you. It's a tough one actually because um, for Amal Falcons, it's mid-October mid on to mid-November in the end of November. Um, I think last week, October, first week of November is absolute peak and super. Um, but a little bit of a shame that in Doyang at that time of year, it's, there's not a lot of variety of birds. So you don't find a lot of the forest birds that we've shown today aren't very easy in the autumn in the Doyang area. So when I went, I spent a few days at Konoma first and then to Doyang. But really for the forest birds, um, it's like the late winter and spring will be the perfect time to be there. So. There is no one time. You have to visit Nagaland at least twice at two different times of the year, I think I'd say. Excellent. So there are more questions here, Mike. Uh, you might just want to answer those questions. Yeah, let me I'll have a look through it. Um, we got here. Uh, just trying to find. Um, I wouldn't know actually other questions. So Jyoti asked about. Um, um, traveling um, alone um, and is it safe um, in Nagaland? I'm a photographer and love to travel. Um, I mean a lot of there's a lot of people not so much birding. I've seen a lot of interesting sort of um, cultural photographic tours um, from people who've traveled in the northeast. Um, so little bit different say I'm not a, a single woman so I haven't quite had the same experience or spent enough time in the northeast but it's certainly the people um, in some of the communities and then the homestays are fantastic and I expect it is uh, but um, I think uh, we'd have to check a little bit more details. Do always get in touch if you're interested in going. Um, yeah, it is quite safe actually, but mm -hmm. but it's advisable to go in a small group because then it works. Uh, you know, uh, the 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 it works out cheaper and and you know there's, there's a lot of uh, um, you know there's a lot of fun element there. So if you're together, it's mm -hmm. better. Yeah. Um, Ashwini is saying it's worrisome to see people res uh, resorting to incessant hunting can only be due to extreme poverty one feels terribly sad yeah i mean it's not I mean, obviously people are poor i mean it, it supplements their food it supplements their income a little bit as well but it's it's a also been very much a traditional thing i think hunting and saying people hunt for the, the culture they always have done so um um so it's um it's changing and in fact it's quite interesting that they these community um uh, conservation areas they have have always existed so they've always recognized themselves i think that um their livelihoods need to be sustainable forests need to have time to recover and things like that um but in some case i mean you you see kids walking around with slingshots in their hand um and you may well come across a kid who's who's um uh, hit a bird and is carrying a bird and it, it happens and it, it's tough to see it a bit but but it's changing i think there's the education side when you see some of those kids in the school of the round punky and their understanding so things are changing uh, but clearly there are areas where hunting is still more prevalent and will be um, but it is thankfully changing yeah so i I'm, I'm quite happy to um, to to uh, set up ecotourism models because that's my expertise so i could mm -hmm. help communities if, if anybody knows of any community in nagaland that needs any help uh, to to put a model project together I could be of help there. Um, Deepak is asking, Amur Falcon is, um, uh, you know, uh, is a big population. Why don't we see large flocks flying over our cities like Bombay during migration? Uh, very good, very good question, actually. Um, 
the main reason is that they migrate at night. Um, so when you're in Nagaland um, and you're there at Doyang, you see these huge flocks. In the daytime, they tend to disperse a bit. They're going out to feed, but they all come back and roost there at night. But their actual migra migratory journey is done at night um, for various reasons. Obviously, they're doing such a long journey. It's cooler. It's easier. Um, so a lot of, like many, like most birds, they migrate at night. Um, but what you sometimes find is a few sightings on the west coast in the autumn of small flocks sometimes um, coming close to the coast. So they probably um, depends on the weather when they actually set across the water, but they will sometimes in early evenings, people will be lucky and seen flocks of tens or hundreds even in the past on the west coast. Um, in the spring a little bit more, they're not in the numbers. And they're also, when they're migrating actually, they're probably not migrating in big flocks. So they're migrating in small groups or individually. Um, so it's only, unusual weather conditions when they might stop and you see them in the daytime. So the prime reason then is that they are just migrating at night, which is why we don't see them. It'd be fantastic actually if there was radar um, coverage, like it's happening a lot in the US with radar tracking of um, migration movements, because if lots of them are setting off on the same night from Nagaland, that would be picked up on radar, it would be, be fantastic. But there are also um, a few places where animals are being seen in the winter in India. Um, so it seems that not all of them make the crossing um, into um, into Africa. Some of them maybe get a little bit disoriented, come a bit further south in India, and some do stay the winter. Um, but in general, yeah, they're all doing that long journey, and then they're coming back. In the spring, they don't tend to stage, they don't wait for so long. Um, birds typically are in more of an urge to get to the breeding ground, so spring, the return migration is usually faster. So. As an the birds I've seen in Mumbai, and you might see in, um, in Pune, and maybe in Karnataka they come. Gujarat, I know they come across, but they're really likely to go through quite quite fast. They're not going you know, to hang around for a few days. Excellent. So Jigen and Rohan have similar questions. You know, uh, cultural tourism, birding tourism, commercial. So can can they sort of do a mix of the two? Uh, my answer would be yes. Absolutely, it's a very rich state for for uh, birds and for culture and you won't be disappointed as long as you you enjoy pork and beef you'll you'll never be short of food anywhere yeah, so you, yeah. <laughs> well, Vivek saying he's coming to the great Hermann national park excellent look forward to seeing you there Vivek. that's going to be a good trip excellent excellent so i posted the link here i'll i'll do it again for those people who are interested in um you know visiting great Hermann national park the first link uh, is a form which you can open up and, and fill up in case if you're interested in Great Himalayan Nash Park. This, the next webinar, uh, Mike, you might want to talk about, which is going to happen next Thursday. And this will be a, a lot of interest to people. It's, yeah, it's interesting actually, because we were looking at, um, we've done, I think it's 11 webinars now across most of India. Um, yeah. So we're wondering what we haven't really done. And um, we've sort of missed out probably the most famous wildlife area in India, which is central India, and the national parks of central India. Uh, maybe because they're not quite so bird focused, and there's a certain mammal that tends to dominate rather there, but we thought we better, we better do them, we better cover them. So we're gonna be uh, touring a little bit of central India, um, which, is, which is fantastic. It's also one of the great tours for doing um, a mix of birds and mammals, of course. Um, so we'll do a few of the reserves um, in Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh in particular uh, next week. That's excellent. That's excellent. So, so it'll be it'll be a, a lot of wildlife as well, and it'll be um, birds and wildlife and tribes and and a bit of cultural stuff and a bit of food. So, uh, so yeah. stay tuned. You'll you'll get an email from me asking you to sign up, and please do so when you when you get the link. And thank you for being here. If there are any more questions. You can always reach out to Mike. Mike's uh, email ID, let me just type it right here. Um, Mike at booboo.org. Yeah, it's just very simple. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, reach out to Mike or to us anytime. Thank you, friends. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Shabbat Thank you, everyone. Namaste. Namaste. Good night. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye.